we've been looking through the book of James, and we've seen that James was written to the 12 tribes, and James gives 12 lessons to those 12 tribes, and we're on lesson number 10 this morning. By the way, you might not like this lesson. I don't, to be honest. But it's a lesson that we need to learn. So be open in your heart and your mind to learn a lesson that you might not want to hear at first. Be willing to listen to God's word. But before we read God's word together, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever wanted to be rich? Oh, yeah! I don't know if any of you ever watched the musical uh, Fiddler on the Roof. But in that musical, Fiddler on the Roof, there's a song that goes, If I were a rich man, da 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 You know that song? And in that song, If I Were a Rich Man, Tevya, one of the characters in the movie, asks this question. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? And I would like to suggest to you that in our text this morning, James answers that question with a yes. It is not in God's eternal plan for all of us to be rich. Whoa. But the pastor on TV said it was. Well, guess what? I would pay my bottom dollar to see the pastor on TV have to preach this lesson. I want you to listen carefully to what James says to rich people. People, James chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded, Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. I told you it would be tough. I want you to remember what James is saying to the rich. First of all, we saw in James chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, that James said the humble should take pride in their high position. In other words, the people who don't have very much money should take pride that God is giving them an elevated position. God is honoring the people without money. And then he said the rich should take pride in their humiliation. In other words, God's value system is exactly the opposite of our value system. We think the rich people are in an honorable position and the poor people are in a not so honorable position. But God flips it on its side and he says the humble people are honored and the rich people have trouble. That's James chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. 
But then in James chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, James asked us several questions. He says, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Is it not the rich who are dragging you into court? Is it not the rich who are blaspheming the name of Christ? And to each of these questions, James is expecting us to answer yes. Now let's look at our text again. James begins this short passage with a rhetorical question, well, with a rhetorical device. It's not a question. A rhetorical device, and he says, now listen, you rich people. Now, something happens when he says, now listen, you rich people. The first thing that happens is some of us defend ourselves and say, uh, I'm not a rich man. Anybody here say, Pastor Tim, I'm not a rich man. I don't have to worry. Well, I want you to think about this. When you, Americans look at, it, at themselves in the perspective of the whole world, things change. Do you know that if your household income is $50,000 a year, it doesn't seem that unreasonable, does it? If your household income is $50,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the world's rich people. <gasps> Maybe the word is for me. Not only are we the world's rich people, but these rich people that James was talking about seem not to have been Christians. They mock the name of the Lord. They do things which seemingly are wrong. But isn't it true that a lesson for people who aren't Christians is a lesson that Christians can learn from as well? When a Christian, sometimes a Christian can actually act like a non-Christian. Have you ever seen that? And maybe we who say, oh yeah, I'm not rich, I'm a Christian. Maybe we need to learn some lessons from this warning to rich non-Christians that James gave. First of all, in verse 1, James instructed the rich to weep and to wail. Now, I haven't seen much weeping and wailing recently. When I was a father of little girls, I saw a little bit of weeping and wailing on occasion. She took my doll! I knew what weeping and wailing was back then, but I haven't seen that much weeping and wailing recently. Why would James tell rich people to weep and to wail? James told rich people to weep and to wail because something was going to happen in the future. As I said before, the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. Do you remember in James chapter 1, James told those who were facing trials to rejoice? Those who are facing difficult times in their lives, rejoice. But now as James draws his letter to the close, he says, I want the rich people to weep. Everything's upside down. Why are they supposed to weep? Because of the misery that is coming on you. God or you might not have experienced this yet, but you will. God is going to judge you for what you have done. It's kind of like when I was a kid and I had done something very wrong. You might not believe this wonderful person could do anything wrong, but I, but I did. 
And once in a while, my mom would say, uh, Tim, just wait till your dad gets home. Have you ever heard something like that? Just wait till your dad gets home. And all of a sudden, the prospect of my dad coming home, which most of the time was a very joyous prospect, all of a sudden the prospect of my dad coming home was not so joyous after all. In fact, it was something that kind of scared me. And James is saying to the rich people, when Jesus returns, it's not going to look good for you. So you better stop or start weeping and wailing now. Then James, in verses 2 and 3, James described the future misery of the rich. He said, your wealth and by wealth, he was talking to agricultural people, so by wealth, he meant their produce, their grain. He says, you know what's happened to your grain? Do you know what's happened to your potatoes? Do you know what's happened to your cauliflower or whatever they were producing? Your, your grain has rotted. Oh, no. You know what happens if my grain rots? I can't sell it. And that means I'm not going to make very much money. You thought you could keep all of your grain and that when you kept all of your grain until the prices went up, then you could sell it and make yourself more rich. But James says, your grain has rotted it doesn't mean anything to you now. Have you ever watched the TV program Hoarders? There are some people who think that they should buy things on sale and then store them so they can re resell them. But there are some people that go overboard and they buy things on sale and they store them and the, their house gets so full of stuff that all of a sudden they have to climb on top of stuff to get to their kitchen and climb on top of stuff to get to their bedrooms. And all of a sudden when they're climbing on top of this stuff, the stuff breaks. And then all of a sudden they have a house full of stuff that is rotted and that is worth nothing. And James says to the rich people, that's what your house looks like. Ouch. Not only is your wealth rotted, he says, secondly, your clothes have become moth-eaten. Sometimes I have a way of choosing my favorite shirt. It just feels better than some of my other shirts, and it looks better, I think, than some of my other shirts. And that shirt becomes my favorite shirt. And every time it comes out of the wash, that's the first shirt that I put on from my closet. Anybody like that? My favorite shirt. The problem is that when I wear my favorite shirt enough, all of a sudden it becomes thinner than all my other shirts. And all of a sudden, it develops rips. And I can't wear my favorite shirt except out in the backyard or around the house. And I, I have this really nice shirt that I only want to wear on special occasions. So I put it away in my closet. And I come to a special occasion. And I take it out of my closet. And yes, a moth has eaten a hole right in an important spot in my favorite shirt. And what I thought was a wonderful possession now needs to be thrown away in the garbage. 
You thought you could store stuff because you wanted, were a rich man, but all of a sudden you've seen that it has holes in it. See, these people paid no attention to the words of Jesus. And by the way, do you remember that James is the brother of Jesus? So James heard his brother say this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wow. James says, your gold and silver are tarnished. When I was a young married person, I uh, got this beautiful uh, picture frame. And this beautiful picture frame was silver, made out of silver. And the first little while, I made sure I polished that silver, and I had my picture of my wedding up in this beautiful silver frame, and I was so proud of this silver frame and the, my wedding picture right in the middle of it. The picture looks fine now, but the frame has become tarnished. And you know what? I don't put it out very much anymore because silver doesn't look all that good when it's been tarnished. And you think that your silver and your gold is something extremely valuable. But James says that even your silver and your gold will get tarnished. And he says that not only do they tarnish, but that their corrosion will testify against you. In other words, you, the tarnish and the corrosion of your silver and gold will say, you thought you had something good, but it didn't last. It will testify against you. And it says it will eat your flesh like fire. Fire has an endless appetite. Fire will eat whatever it can burn until it's eaten it all and there's nothing left. And that's what will happen to everything that you cling to and you say is yours. I have this stuff. Well, you might have this stuff until the fire comes. And after the fire has come, you will not have this stuff anymore. Just ask the people in some of those wealthy areas in Los Angeles that fire went through their, their housing development and they saw nothing left when they came back to their house. Ask them how much their stuff is worth. James says that the rich should weep and wail. They should weep and wail because of the, their, their future misery. But then secondly, or thirdly, they should, James explains the reason for their misery. Why is God punishing them with this fire? Why are they experiencing this great loss? Look at verses 3 to 6, the last part of verse 3. 
You're going to go through this suffering because you hoarded your wealth. I don't know if you've ever seen little kids playing, but I've watched it a lot. Don't forget, I used to be a daycare worker. I managed a room of 21 four- and five-year-olds. I know a little bit about how kids play. That's mine, and you can't have it. I heard that a hundred times a week. Kids hoard things. They want to protect them for themselves. And guess what? When kids turn to be adults, they still hoard things. They keep them for their, themselves and against others. To hoard means to keep for yourselves. And James says you have hoarded your wealth in the last days. Why does he say in the last days? It's the last days before God's judgment comes on hoarders. In other words, you're not getting ready for the Lord's return. You're hoarding and you're hoarding and you're hoarding in light of the fact that Jesus is coming to judge the people who are hoarding. You know, it's, it's a ridiculous activity that you're involved in. You're doing it till it's too late to repent. You're hoarding your wealth in these last days. The second thing that reason James gives us is not only you have hoarded your wealth, but you have failed to pay your workers. How many farmers do we have in the Central Valley who choose to get illegals to work on their farms and they pay them less than minimum wage because they're illegal and they won't complain about it anyway? And James says, you have failed to pay your workers their rightful wages, and that's a sin against God. I told you you might not like this. <laughs> you have hoarded your wealth. You have failed to pay your workers. At that time, there were day laborers. And you agreed at the beginning of the day this would be your wage, and at the end of the day, some of the work or some of the landowners would say, well, you didn't do a very good job, so I'm going to pay you less than we agreed. When in reality, those people worked very hard and they deserved their wage. And James says, you withhold the wage that you promised that's one of the ways that God is going to come back and judge you. Number one, you hoarded your wealth. Number two, you have failed to pay your workers. Number three, you have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. You got everything you could and you canned it. You can all you get, and you get all you can. And you do it for self. Where Jesus didn't think of himself, he died for others, for you and for me. So for you to keep everything for yourself, for you to live in self-indulgence, is the exact opposite of the way that Jesus wants you to live. Feeling guilty yet? I am. You have hoarded your wealth. You have failed to pay your workers, and their wages cry out against you. You have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. And then the last one is you have con condemned or condemned and murdered the innocent. 
and it can be translated the innocent one. Who had the rich religious leaders murdered? They murdered the Lord Jesus. And Jesus had done nothing wrong. And who do we murder? We murder the people that we don't care for. We murder the people that we don't treat right. And they've done nothing wrong against us. James says, you rich people, it's time to weep and to wail. Why? Because your future judgment is coming. Why is judgment coming? Because you've failed to do what God wanted you to do. You have hoarded your wealth. You have failed to pay your workers. You have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. And you have condemned and murdered the innocent. Do Christians ever do these things? <sighs> Unfortunately, we have. So what do we do? There's a little word in the Bible. It's called repent. It means to change your way of living. James is using a rhetorical advice and talking to those rich people out there. But when we, he, we listen to him talk to those rich people out there, we realize that we're, he's actually talking to us too. And it's time for us to tell God that we're willing to change. We're willing to have him change us and our attitude to riches, and our attitude towards others who we should be sharing with. We should not envy the rich. If they became rich honestly, that's fine. But they should be willing to share with those in need. But if they became rich out of on the backs of others, or if they hoarded their riches for themselves, they will be severely judged. And we should learn from this warning. Let's pray. Lord, you were rich but we, you became poor so that we, through your poverty, could become rich. Thank you for your willingness to give all so that we could benefit from it. Help us never to cling so much to what we have that we're not willing to give it away to bless others. Help us not to be the kind of rich people who ignore the people around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.